Good morning, Valley family. Great to see everybody uh, here today. Uh, This is actually week number 12 in our series, ER, Extraordinary Relationships. And uh, it's been really good. We just kept stretching it out, stretching it out. We've heard so much uh, real positive feedback about it. However, next week it's coming to an end. Next week is going to be the last week uh, in this message series. And uh, I've, I've just asked a real ringer to bring the message next week. You don't want to miss it. I want to invite you back for it. My wife Susie is going to be doing the finale uh, for the ER series. I think we can give it up for Susie for sure. I'm going to sit in the front row and just adore her. Uh, She's going to be talking about living the unoffended life. Living the unoffended life. You do know like as Christians, we're, we're supposed to be very hard to offend. And uh, she's going to remind us of that and, and all that God's word has to say about that. And then we're starting a brand new series in two weeks, and you'll see a little bit more, hear more about that uh, next week. But uh, today for, for my final message uh, in, in this series, I, I want to talk about uh, the triad of trust, the triad of trust, embracing the power of three, the power of three. And uh, I've been working on this for a couple of weeks. I had no idea that the timing of this would be the timing that it really is. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware. Of course, I'm a pastor, so I, I make myself very aware of these things. But uh, just in the last month or so, three major, major names in Christianity, pastors, have fallen into moral failure. Uh, two of them had to resign their churches of over 40 years that they started. And uh, this, one of this just broke on Friday. And uh, between just these three churches, we're talking about about 75,000 people attend just these three churches. And uh, it was a gut punch. I, I'm feeling a little bit better uh, right now at, at 1030 and want to welcome all of our online campus folks that are, are joining us. But 9 o'clock, it was tough for me to kind of get through it. Uh, but because my heart is just breaking for people that because of pastors and what they have done and, and gotten themselves into that they shouldn't have and, and, and all that, that there are going to be many people that are going to turn away from God and never come back. And uh, because we put so often times, there should be a level of trust. We're going to talk about that today in these, this triad, or these triad relationships, the power of three. But uh, ultimately, we have to have our trust in God. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you three relationships that I think are absolutely critical for every Christian. Three relationships. If, you're, if your faith is going to grow strong, if the roots of your faith are going to go down really, really deep, and, and your faith is going to flourish from this day forward for the rest of your life, I think it's absolutely essential that we cultivate these three relationships. Now, they don't happen overnight. It's not like just to flip a switch and it happens, but, but until we put these on the radar of our personal life, we're, we're never going to look for these type of relationships. And, and so I want to share with you these three relationships, and I call this the triad of trust, because I believe that, that if, if these relationships, could I put it this way, were in the lives of some other pastors even, we wouldn't see them on the front uh, headlines of the newspapers today. And all of the news agencies reporting on these, these just absolute scandalous things that have happened. And so, first one is this. I think everyone needs a Paul in their life, a spiritual father in their life. Paul is a representative of a spiritual father in the New Testament. Think about it, Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Everyone needs someone like that in their life. Not that's writing scripture. Scripture's not being written anymore. But, but someone who's ahead of them in their faith that has weathered some stuff that's in a different season of their life and that can help them navigate through what they're going through personally at this time. Everyone needs a Paul, a spiritual father. A Paul is a trusted spiritual father or a spiritual mother that provides guidance, wisdom, accountability based on their experience and their maturity in the faith. Oftentimes, like I said, are in a different season of their life than, than, than you may be. Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 puts it this way. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. 
For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul here is writing to the church of Corinth, and he's like, I'm your spiritual father. I I really birthed you. I'm your spiritual parent. And and he says, you may have 10,000 instructors. That, That word instructor means instructor. It also means teacher. It may actually even mean mentor. He's like, those are easy to come by. But you only in your life potentially have just a few fathers, spiritual fathers in your life that can can be a spiritual father to help to guide and direct you. I wouldn't be the man I am today if it weren't for three spiritual fathers in my life that I've had. The first was my own father, my own father that led me to faith in Jesus Christ, who founded this church. He, of course, was not just an earthly father, but he was a spiritual father to me as well. And then in, the, uh, in my 30s and, and 40s, uh, another spiritual father came into my life, and his name was Dr. Ron Cottle. And he helped me so much to see who it was that God had really created me to be, speak a lot of purpose into my life, and help me to take some, some big, big steps of, of spiritual growth and leadership as well. And then the third spiritual father in my life, just because Dr. Cottle's 90 years old and just doesn't have the capacity that he once had when, when it was in his 70s and all that. Uh, he's 90, uh, just turned 90. But, but for the last about 10 years, has been John Kelly, spiritual father in my life, spiritual father to many, many pastors, and spiritual father to us. And, and, and John, uh, he comes every year, and we don't have it yet on the calendar because he's in Brazil right now. He spoke last night to 70,000 people in Brazil entire huge soccer stadium that they rented out. John Kelly was speaking, 70,000. Day before, he had a leadership meeting with 7,000 pastors all across Brazil. That's my spiritual papa right there. And and, uh, we keep in touch on a regular basis. And he has helped me so much because you can have 10,000 instructors. I've had all kinds of mentors in my life. I've had mentors that have helped me in theology and, and it helped me in my preaching. I've had mentors, uh, leadership. John Maxwell has been a huge mentor in my life. Uh, I've read so many of his books and still do. Just absolutely love it. Grown so much. Mentors are easy to find. Fathers are hard to find. But I think every single Christian, if you're going to flourish in your faith, you need a spiritual father. Someone that you can call when something's just not right on the inside and I don't know what it is. There have been times when, when Susie has said to me, I think you need to call Papa Kelly. There have been times when I said, I think you need to call Papa Kelly. And, and, and just, to, just to process and just to talk about the struggles, what's really going on in the inside. Who knows what's really going on in the inside of you? I think every single person needs a Paul, a spiritual father, in their life. And, and let me say this, just, just in terms of the, the, the scandals that have been rocking a, lo- a lot of the churches, uh, as I mentioned, uh, particularly in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in the last month or so, I think it's important that you know this because I do have spiritual fathers in my life and they, they speak into my life and they, they hold me accountable and they help me when, when I'm struggling, all those things. Maybe you're new to Valley Church. I want you to know something about Valley Church I want you to know that, like, I want you to know something about me that maybe you don't know. Most of you do, but m- maybe you don't. Because I, I think it's real easy to go from church to church as a pastor, to, to go to a new place, to reinvent yourself, and nobody really knows who you are. And what they see is just a gift, but they don't know who the person actually is. That's not what you've come to here at Valley Church. We're a family. I've lived in this community since I was five years old. Five years old. I went to Gay Head Elementary School right around the corner. I went to Van Wyck Junior High School, drove by it on the way here today. I graduated from John Jay High School, the local high school of this community in which you sit right now. There are still teachers that I had in high school that are still in this community, girls that I dated in high school that are still in this community, friends that I have, parents of friends I have in this community. I mean, I am well known. There's no, you know, like skeletons in the closet or anything like that. This is my home. This is who you are. This is who I am. I also have had the privilege of coaching high school football at John Jay going into my 14th season coming up this year. 
and, and, and just having that impact in the community. Listen, it's too much that we idolize gifting in our culture and we minimize character and then when something hits the front page, we're aghast because we elevate gifting, but gifting is not the same as character. Character is what you look for in a spiritual father. Not someone who's afraid to tell you the truth, but to look you in the eyes and say, listen, you're wrong. This is not right. Paul was able to do that. Look at the characteristics of Paul. This is a true spiritual father, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. He didn't say, do what I tell you. He said, live the way I showed you. There's a huge difference there. That's what I've tried to do all my life here in this community, to live out my life the way God wanted me to live out my life with the whole community watching. It's so important that we understand that. It's not about a gift that someone has that we elevate them and we put all kinds of expectation upon because of a gift. What's the character of that person? What's the content of their character? That's what makes the difference. See, here's the reason why. Consistency compounds and credibility does too. Consistency compounds and credibility does too. When you're, when you're looking for someone to fill that place of a spiritual father in your life, don't chase after a title. Chase after character. Chase after character. Because here's the thing. You teach what you know, but you reproduce who you actually are. Let me say that again. You teach what you know, but a person reproduces what they actually are. Not the knowledge they have, the essence of who they actually are. Big, big difference there, so important. Whoever mentors you is just as important as what they tell you, the wisdom that they give you. The giftedness is greater than the person. If you've really got the goods, let me put it this way, you don't have to recruit. Spiritual fathers don't have to recruit. Spiritual mothers don't have to recruit. I, I, I'm so thankful that, that not only have I had spiritual fathers in my life, but, but that we've got a team of, of real spiritual mothers and fathers in this church. Much of our staff, our pastoral staff, great spiritual fathers and mothers that, that are here to help you, to be that for you. Every one of us needs that. We find so often in our freedom groups just the, just the power as, as people begin to connect and all, there, there, there's a spiritual dynamic and a component there that even after the 12 weeks are over and we have our freedom conference, the groups want to continue to meet together because something has happened under the, the wise leadership of that leader. Something has happened. There's a dynamic. that They're like, we want to continue this. Everyone needs a spiritual parent in their life. So incredibly important. Everyone needs a spiritual father, a Paul. I think the second uh, dynamic relationship that's so important, everyone needs a Barnabas in their life. A Barnabas, what is that? A spiritual friend. Barnabas was an encourager in the Bible, in the book of Acts. That's what his name literally means, is encouragement. God used Barnabas to bring Paul out of Antioch and into fruitful ministry where the two of them teamed up. If you don't know anything about Barnabas, you can read about him in, the, in the, about the middle part, middle section of the book of Acts. When Paul the apostle, uh, Jesus appeared to him, he was named Saul at the time, and, and knocked him off his horse and uh, made him go blind for a just temporary time period. And uh, when he converted, because he was a persecutor of the church, he went to the apostles and they were like, uh... And he's like, no, I've had this experience with Jesus. And they're like, uh. And they put him on the shelf. You ready for this? Some scholars believe up to 11 years. 11 years. 11 years after he had this incredible experience with Jesus and the apostles didn't trust him. They're like, oh, we don't know about that. But they were going to send out this guy named Barnabas to Antioch to spread the gospel to Antioch. And Barnabas... This encourager remembered this guy named Paul. And he said, would it be okay if I invited Paul to go with me to Antioch? Barnabas was the leader of the mission team. 
And the apostle said, yeah, that's okay. And that was when all of a sudden, because Barnabas believed in Paul, that all of a sudden he blossomed as a leader and only ends up writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Incredible. Barnabas, this encourager. And encourage. What kind of spiritual friend do you have, like a Barnabas, that encourages you towards fulfilling God's plan and purpose for your life? Every one of us needs a Barnabas, a spiritual friend. Barnabas is a supportive and an encouraging friend who walks alongside you in your faith journey, offering companionship, empathy, and spiritual fellowship. Barnabas is like, you're not in this alone. We're right here with you. We're walking together. We're sharing your life with someone else. I remember when I was a young pastor, uh, I got burnt out really, really quick in my 20s. And uh, at the time, Susie's parents, my in-laws, lived down in Palm Bay, Florida. And we'd go to on vacation in Palm Bay, Florida. And it was like all I could do just to get there because I was just so exhausted. I was so burnt out. And, uh, and I'll never forget in, in the uh, mid to late 90s, just laying there on a lounge chair in the sun, I had my Sony Walkman with my Greatest Hits of Journey uh, cassette tape, and I'm listening to Journey's Greatest Hits, and while I'm listening to Journey's Greatest Hits, I'm praying. And I'm praying, I said, God, don't make me go back to that place in New York. I don't like those people in that church. They don't like me either. Don't make me go back. I was talking about here. And I felt like God just in, in my thoughts, he just spoke to me and he said, I'm gonna refresh you while you're here, but this is not gonna last. I want you to go back to New York and there's five men in the church and they were specific men. I could see their faces. He said, I want you to meet each one of them individually for breakfast. And I want you to tell them, I need you to be my friend. Would you just be my friend? And he said, and friendship based on faith is what's going to keep you fresh. That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm here today. I met with each of those men. I said, I just need you to be a friend to me. In Bible college and seminary, it may, sound, it may sound really, really crazy and weird. Most Bible colleges and seminaries teach pastors you cannot have close friends with anyone in your church. Don't even try it. It'll blow up in your face. And it's to the detriment of pastors. I was taught that. You cannot have close friends with people in your church. It'll blow up in your face. But I was dying without him. So I'd rather die with someone else than die alone, you know? And so I went and I just said, I, I, I need you to be my friend. I, I, need, I need to trust my heart to you, my soul to you. Those men said, okay, we got you. Some of those men are still incredibly good friends in this church today, decades and decades later. We've raised our kids together. We've married them off. They've got grandkids and we've got one coming on the way, our first one. The power of friendship. Who's a Barnabas in your life? A spiritual friend that can really help you, really encourage you when you're struggling so that you know you're not alone. Having a Barnabas in your life can provide emotional support, encouragement, accountability, shared experiences and faith, fostering spiritual growth and resilience. You know, I've, I'm, I'm so thankful for spiritual friends in my life. Just thinking about it, we had uh, dinner this past week with Aaron and Karen Johnson. And uh, Aaron and Karen, been a long time, almost 30 years, members of this church. They hosted, think about how long this is, spiritual friend. They hosted a surprise birthday party for me at their home when I turned 30. Now, that was a whole year ago, but <laughs> no, when I turned 30, that was a long time ago. That was over a quarter of a century ago when I turned 30 in their home. That's what I call spiritual friends. That's what I call just sharing your life with one another. There are times that, 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 that I was going to quit as a pastor of this church, and I called my spiritual friend, Aaron, 
I called another friend. He since has moved away. And, and I said, guys, this is it. It's over. I'm done. And they're like, you're not done. You're just upset. Come on, let's go. We went out to the lake. We're just skipping rocks. I'll never forget that conversation at Sylvan Lake, right here in this community, skipping rocks on Sylvan Lake. And they said, listen, you're not alone. You're just frustrated. We're with you. We're going to encourage you. We're going to inspire you. We're going to walk through this with you. It's made all the difference in my life. Spiritual fathers, Paul. Spiritual friends, Barnabas. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 puts it this way. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. That's what we need to do. We need to not only have a Barnabas, could I put it this way? Every one of us as Christians needs to be a Barnabas. We need to be a Barnabas. We need to, when we have a conversation with someone, we need to leave them better and more encouraged than before that conversation began. We need to be a Barnabas. We need to be a spiritual friend. Those that, that lift people up. That's one of the great benefits of a Barnabas in your life. They can provide prayer support, shared experiences, strengthening your faith and your resilience on your spiritual journey. Who's your Barnabas? Who's a spiritual friend that you're developing in your life right now? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 10 said, Two, it says, Two are better than one. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. So important. You can't develop these, you know, hope these friendships and relationships are there when crisis or, or calamity or tragedy hits. It's too late at that point. You've got to build these up. You have to develop them now for the difficult times, for the dark times. Everyone needs a spiritual father, a Paul. Every Christian, I believe, needs a spiritual friend, a Barnabas, because two are better than one. And the third thing is this, everyone needs a spiritual protege. Timothy's an example of that in the New Testament. Timothy, in Paul's travels, he ran into a young man who was a follower of Christ named Timothy in Acts chapter 16, verse 1 through 4. And for over a decade, Paul invested deeply into the life of Timothy. So much so that he ended up transitioning the church of Ephesus to Timothy. Most scholars believe he was in his 30s, Timothy. Church of Ephesus at the time, again, most scholars believe somewhere between 4,000 and 7,000 people. Paul started that church and he said, here you go, Timothy. And because he was a spiritual protege of Paul, Paul made it so clear. He's like, if Timothy says it, it's just like me saying it. Because we're so close. A spiritual father and a spiritual son, a spiritual protege. We're so close. When Timothy gives his opinion on something, guess what? It's going to be Paul's opinion. Incredibly important to develop these type of relationships. And maybe you're hearing like, man, I've only been a Christian for like a month. <laughs> you know, I, I just came to faith in Jesus. How can I have a, a spiritual protege? Listen, if you know this much about Jesus, you know more than someone that knows this much about Jesus. My dad used to put it this way, in the valley of the blind, it's the one-eyed man who's the king. In the valley of the blind, it's the one-eyed man who's the king. If you know anything about walking with Jesus, you can share that with someone that doesn't know as much as you do. This is what the Bible talks about. It calls this word discipleship, raising and training up more believers in Jesus Christ. Timothy's a younger and less experienced believer who needed a spiritual father in his life, and he becomes a disciple that Paul invested himself in, passing on the faith and equipping the next generation of disciples for the next generation. That our faith, we're here today because Paul passed on, developed this spiritual protege in his life named Timothy. So much of our faith because of that relationship right there. It's absolutely critical. And let me say this, moms, dads, you know who your primary spiritual protege is if you're a mom or a dad? Your kids. That's your first level of, of spiritual proteges right there, your kids. So incredibly important to raise your kids, to influence your kids towards godliness, towards their faith in Jesus Christ. I, I remember 
this very well-known story in my family. When we were living in Georgia, and I was like one-year-old or two-year-old when this happened, uh, I have two older brothers, and this is my older brother when he was still young, maybe five or six at the time. And uh, my father used to volunteer for what was back then in the 70s, it was called a, a, a drug hotline. And, and people that had problems with drug, drug addiction and all, that they would call this hotline and they would get help. So three nights a week, my father would come home. He was an engineer at the time for Georgia Pacific. He'd come home, he'd eat dinner, and then he'd go back out and volunteer time on the drug hotline answering the phone and helping people. And as I, my father has told the story over through the years, and I remember it so clearly, again, my older brother was five, six years old, and after dinner one night, dad went into the bathroom and he had a five o'clock shadow and he, and he shaved because you had to wear like a tie and everything. It was a different world back then, you know. And, and uh, so he's shaving the five o'clock shadow and my brother comes walking in, five or six year old, little rusty. And he says to my dad, he goes, daddy, where are you going? And my father said, I'm going to volunteer my time answering phones for this drug hotline. And my brother said, what's a drug hotline? And he said, well, that's where people that, that they, they take drugs and it, it begins to overpower them and, and they, they get what's called addicted. They can't stop and it really begins to do some destructive things in their life. He tried to explain it in the little boy's terms so he could understand it. And then he said, my brother, little Rusty Williams, since five, six years old, he looked at my father and he said, daddy, I'm so proud of you. That's so great that you're doing that. And then he said, I hope there's someone there for me just like you when I'm addicted to drugs one day. <laughs> True story. My father went down that night and resigned. <laughs> because he said, how can I help someone else's children before I help my own? change the trajectory of the Williamson family. Because my father said, I have to help my own children first before I can help someone else's. Moms and dads, your primary protégés are your kids. They're your kids. It's so important. A Timothy is what to look for in a protégé, teachable. Timothy's faithful, or Timothy's humble. Timothy's eager to learn, willing to learn, embodies spiritual growth, service, and is willing to make disciples himself. Proverbs 13, 20 puts it this way. You walk with the wise, you become wise. But a companion of fools suffers harm. Who is wise in your life that you're committed to walk with? Who, who, is, who are you benefiting from their experience, their wisdom on a regular basis that's helping you to become better? Because you walk with the wise, and by the way, in the Bible, there's only two kinds of people, wise and foolish. There's no in-between. There's no in-between. You walk with the wise, you become more wise but you hang out with fools, you get harmed as a result of it. That's what the Bible says. Even if you're not doing foolish stuff, you hang out with fools, destruction is gonna happen all around you and it's gonna hurt you too. Walk with the wise, become wise. Timothy allows for, being a Timothy allows for spiritual growth. It's an opportunity to pass on faith to future generations and to leave a legacy of faithfulness and impact in the kingdom of God. Everyone needs a spiritual father, a Paul. I believe everybody needs a spiritual friend, a Barnabas. I believe every, every Christian needs a spiritual protege, a Timothy. The reason for that is the power of three. Triad relational impact. Huge, huge impact with three. Spiritual father, spiritual friend, spiritual protege. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse 12 says, though one may be overpowered, two can de defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. 
Think about that, a, a rope that, that is made of three smaller ropes that is braided together, that is one strong rope. Three different strands braided together. That's an incredibly strong rope. That's the incredibly strong, extraordinary relationships that God wants you to have and experience in your life. Those are the extraordinary relationships God wants me to continue to experience in my life. Three cord rope is not quickly broken. The triad relations, Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, the triad of relationships, their synergy, it promotes mutual growth, accountability, support, and multiplication in discipleship. Encourage one another, and I just encourage you through these relationships to encourage one another and also to embrace these roles. So where do you start, Greg? What, what can I do? I don't, I don't see that I have any one of these three really in my life. I've got a lot of friends. They're not spiritual friends. They don't inspire me to be more like Jesus. They inspire me to be more like them and, and the world. Where do I start? Well, you see these little cards on everybody's seat right there? We have our summer groups that are opening up. It's a great place to start in valley groups. We have all different kinds of groups. Let me just read you the list of, of groups that are available right now. Some of them are Bible study groups. Some of them are all different interest groups. We have a group of parents, a uh, group for parents of teens and preteens. After Saturday prayer pickleball, you can go to that and, you know, tear your ACL. You just go right ahead. And uh, how about this one? Braving Change is the Lineals Women's Small Group. Creative Writing with the Holy Spirit. Everyday Jesus, Financial Peace University, find out biblical principles of how to handle your finances and get on track financially. Hiking the Hudson Valley, James 526 men's groups, Latinos for Christ. Are there any Latinos in the house? We have a whole group. How about that? Latinos for Christ. You can sign up for that and get involved there. Life in Christ, living in freedom, mommy and me meetups, morning prayers and coffee with Jesus, Saturday morning men, sisters on mission, the rhythm of us, a, a married group, Tuesday night Bible study. It just goes on and on. This is all there. This is all just way, just an opportunity of this is why we do all these groups in our church is so that you can find a spiritual father, a spiritual friend, a spiritual protege. The power of three, the triad. And we've got more than that. I'm just not going to take the time to read every one. It just goes on and on and on. That's just for this summer, the groups that we have that are open and available Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, puts it this way. And let us consider how we may spurn one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up, meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What's that day? That day is the end of time. Time is winding down. I don't know when it is that, that Jesus, he said he's going to come back again a second time. I don't know when that date is. I do know this, we're closer to it now than we were yesterday. That day of his return is coming. And the Bible says, don't forsake, don't give up meeting together. There's a lot of things that this verse means, and it, oftentimes it's used in a context of come to church on Sunday mornings. Make sure you don't, you know, forget to come to church every single Sunday morning. It may mean that, but I don't think it means that. I've probably used it that way, but I don't think that's the essence of what this means. I, I think what the essence of this means when you look at the habit of doing all, you know, on a regular basis, what is it talking about? I think it's talking about getting together with spiritual friends, spiritual parents spiritual protege on a daily basis, not just one day a week, but developing and cultivating these relationships on an ongoing basis. Because we all need encouragement. One, you know, one little shot in the arm a week, it's just not enough. We need to develop these relationships on an ongoing basis that will help us to have spiritual vitality, spiritual health, and could I put it this way, spiritual fitness through these relationships. So incredibly important. And it says the word giving up there that, that is uh, in that passage where it says not giving up meeting together, it literally means to abandon or desert. It's not about abandoning a building or deserting a church service 
It's about abandoning a friend. It's about abandoning or deserting a person. Don't abandon the spiritual friendships, spiritual protégés, spiritual parents that God's placed in your life. Prioritize these relationships and encourage one another all the more so as you see that day approaching. So what I want to do right now with these three key relationships in mind, I, I, I just want to close this message right now in prayer that we would really, each and every one of us would begin to prioritize a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy in our lives. And spiritually, we're gonna be stronger and healthier because of it. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the examples, the godly examples in your word Paul, of Barnabas, and of Timothy. Lord, relationships are hard. Relationships are messy. They're not easy. But they're so necessary and critical to our spiritual growth and vitality. So God, I just pray for every one of us, myself included, Lord, that we would begin to prioritize these spiritual relationships. This triad of trust would be cultivated in our life of a spiritual parent, a spiritual friend, a spiritual protege. God, that just like your word says that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken, that that would be representative of each and every one of our spiritual lives because we have prioritized these relationships. God, help us to see the relationships that you want us to cultivate in our lives that would bring perseverance, that would bring hope, that would bring encouragement, that would bring some fun and some laughter that's really focused around you, that we would blossom in our faith and the roots of our faith would go down even deeper, Lord. Thank you for the opportunities that we have here at Valley Church, Lord, and through these groups that are so much an integral part of everything we do. Lord, I just pray a blessing on every group leader, every group member. Lord, as they really seek these friendships out through Valley Groups. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 